You guys ready to get into the word? Yeah, cool. All right, so we sit at tables for those of you who are newer to the community uh, because after I'm done up here with the message, uh, we have opportunity at our tables to talk around uh, what we talked about tonight. And so we just really believe that on these evenings, we're not just here to engage with the stage and people with a mic, but God does some of you know, the great things that he does in a community like this through the conversations that take place at tables. Um, and so if you're new, hey, engage at the level that you feel comfortable with this evening when we get to that portion. But we've been in a series called Relatable, and we're talking about things that have to do with our relational lives. And the reason why we're talking about this is because we all could use help when it comes to relationships in our lives. Can I get an amen? Um, (laughs) But also because when it comes to following Jesus, you know, following Jesus, as we've been saying, it's not just about believing all the right things, believing all the right truths, but it's also about living in right relationship. It's about living in right relationship with God, but also learning how to live in right relationship with others. You know, when sin came into the world, that's what sin separated. It separated us from right relationship with God, but it also separated right relationship between each other. And so that's what Jesus has reconciled. And that's actually the theme of this evening. What we're going to be talking about tonight is reconciliation. And so we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to pick it up in verse 17. And we're going to jump in. It says, therefore, if any... Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Would you guys pray with me? Father, we, we thank you once again just for this evening. And now just as we look at your word and some of these thoughts, God, I just pray that you would, you would help us to receive, you'd help us to listen. And God, we just thank you that you would move upon this time. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, have you guys seen that movie where, you know, this, this guy meets this girl and then they like fall in love and you know they, they kind of have this whole moment where there's like this movie montage and it's like you just see how perfect their romantic relationship is, you know, and everything seems, seems so great. They never thought that they would find someone like they found and all that. And then all of a sudden, like somewhere near the middle of the movie, like the wheels kind of fall off the thing and, and they all of a sudden find out, like she finds out that the only reason why they ever met was because like his friends bet that he couldn't get her to like fall in love with him and stuff. And then so she can't believe it and she's so hurt. And, and then their relationship just falls apart. And so then they're like both, both miserable and like the weather's been perfect the whole movie. And then all of a sudden it's like raining. You know what I'm talking about? And, and you know, they're, they're both miserable and all this. And, and the guy just finally like comes to himself and he's like, you know, I, I can't live without this girl. Like I have to make this thing right. And so then they have that like, crazy scene where it always takes place at an airport and and he's like chasing her down because she's about to take a flight and she's about to like leave the country and so he's like running through security and all these things and he's chasing down to her terminal and he finally gets there and there happens to be like this airline attendant right there who's probably a lady and he tells her like the woman that I love is on that plane and she's about to leave my life and I just I can't live without her I got to get on that plane and she has like a soft spot and so miraculously like they let him on the plane you know what I'm talking about and then in front of like a bunch of strangers he just out loud like confesses his love for for her, tells her how sorry he is and that, you know, he, he doesn't care how they met, but he just can't live without her. And she forgives him and they like run to each other and, and they kiss. And then the movie's over. You guys know what I'm talking about? You ever seen that movie? I just made that whole thing up, but I've seen countless movies that are exactly like that. And I'm sure you have too. And it's because so many movies that we watch, so many stories that we read or whatever, they all follow this story arc that is the arc of reconciliation, right? It's this arc where things are good. There is people in a right relationship. They're in a friendly relationship or a romantic relationship and everything is good. And then all of a sudden things fall apart and, and they become, you know, separated from each other or they become like enemies of each other. And then, then things have to get reconciled and brought back to peace and they, they, be, they get restored to favor and friendliness once again. 
And that is such a common story arc that you and I fall for, especially like this time of year, over and over again. I don't know about you, but I'm about to get set up to watch a whole bunch of movies that follow that exact arc because my wife loves to watch all those fall and holiday romantic movies that are all terrible. But anyway, um, you know, so many movies follow this arc because it's actually part of the greatest story that's ever been told. And that is the gospel story. You know, reconciliation is at the heart of the gospel message. And that is the greatest story, the greatest love story that's ever been told. And that's the reason why so many stories follow this arc. You know, think about the gospel. It's the reality that God the creator created humanity in right relationship with him, friends of God, meant to to know him, to love him, to serve him, right? And the relationship is good, but things get bad. You know, humanity chooses to actually sin and disobey God's command and, and separates themselves from God by literally choosing that we don't need to be under a God, but we can become our own gods, and the relationship falls apart. There's a separation because of sin between God and humanity, but also between humanity and humanity. You know, Adam and Eve hide from each other, and and there's been this kind of relational issue because of all of that. But the good news about the relationship and about the story is the fact that God cares a lot more about our relationship with him than we do. You know, that God would not allow us to stay in that place where we were separated and no longer in right relationship, no longer friends, but God is the one who goes to work to restore things, that he initiates reconciliation with us. He's the one that was sinned against. He's the one that was offended. He's the one that was hurt, but he's the one that goes first. He's the one that initiates reconciliation with us, and he he comes in the form of a baby. He comes as Jesus, and and Jesus lives among us. Jesus lives this perfect, sinless life, ultimately here to reconcile us back to God. And Jesus, through him, we see that, you know, God loves us. You know, God could have totally been the one who says, you know what, forget you. I don't need you. (laughs) I'm gonna be fine without you. And that would have all been true for God. But he doesn't. God says, I want you. I love you. I forgive you. And I'm bringing you back. And through Jesus and through what he does ultimately upon the cross, in dying and rising again, Jesus actually brings us back into right relationship with God. And he restores us back to God. In Romans 5, 10 through 11, the Bible says this, For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies... We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus. And there is no salvation without reconciliation. And the thing is this, is that for us, we need the ministry of reconciliation. We absolutely need reconciliation when it comes to us and God, obviously. But we need reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation when it comes to our relational lives. You know, we've been talking about relationships, you know, this whole series. And the reality is this, is that if you want to live in a healthy and long lasting relationship in your life, you're going to need the ministry of reconciliation. Without the ministry of reconciliation in your life, what's going to happen is you're going to be someone who jumps from friend group to friend group. You're gonna be someone who jumps from romantic partner to romantic partner. You might be someone who jumps from church to church. (laughs) You might even be someone someday who jumps from marriage to another marriage. Or you might just end up being someone who just says, forget the whole thing altogether and gives up on relationships. Without reconciliation, we will become someone who knows a whole lot about relational brokenness and not very much about relational wholeness in our lives. Reconciliation is at the heart of the gospel, but it's also at the heart of what makes for healthy and lasting relationships in our lives. And so what we wanna do is we wanna look at this verse out of the passage we just read in verse 19 and look and see that there's actually some things it shows us here 
about reconciliation. In verse 19, it says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. First thing, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. The first thing we see is that it's the initiation of reconciliation, right? And the crazy thing about this is that, you know, God goes first, that God is the one who goes first. You know, reconciliation, it's not going to happen without initiation. But the unique thing about the gospel and the unique thing about what we're called to as believers is that whether or not we're the ones who are wronged or whether or not we're the ones who are sinned against, we're actually called to be the ones who initiate when it comes to the reconciliation, right? And the Bible, it tells us things like this. You know, when, when you're wrong, this is what the Bible says, Matthew 5, 23 through 24 in the message. It says, this is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship, and are about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you, abandon your offering, leave immediately, go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then, come back and work things out with God. How many of you think that reconciliation matters to God? Where he's like, you're gonna come and worship me? This is the type of worship I actually want. Why don't you go make things right? Right, you see that? And the thing is, it's, you know, when, when you're wrong, you go. But then the Bible also talks about when they're wrong. Mark eleven twenty five says, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive you your sins. When they're wrong, Matthew 18, 15, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, You've won that person back. How many of you think reconciliation matters to God? You know, having peace restored in a relationship, being brought back to friendliness matters to God. It's the heart of the gospel. It's God's own heart, right? And it's God's heart to confront the issues and not just let things kind of linger, not just let things fester. You know, there's an urgency even in God's heart when it comes to reconciliation because he's a God of peace, but he's also a God of humility. Because how many of you know we have to humble ourselves if we're going to do this? You know, um, how many of you desire to be married someday? It's okay to admit it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've been married. It'll, it'll be going on nine years. We'll be celebrating nine years this coming December. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've been married for nine years, and it's, it's been an amazing nine years. You know, we've had an amazing time just growing as a couple. We've also brought like four kids into the world, which is crazy. Um, and, and like genuinely, like we're blessed. But also in those nine years, it has been challenging. You know, and if Nicole was in the room, she would be saying amen real loud from the back. You know, but it, it has been, it's been challenging because there have been times where we just have, you know, hurt and disappointed and offended each other. And there's just been some times where there's been like, like certain weeks where there's just been like, like a tension in the relationship, you know, and we pray that those are weeks where we don't have to preach, you know, but there's just those weeks where it's just like things are tense because we haven't yet talked about what we need to talk about or whatever. There just have been those times in nine years of marriage. All is well tonight, praise God. But, um, you know, but it's just, it's just the reality. And the thing is when... There are those moments when I've been, you know, hurt or offended or disappointed. It happens a lot more for, you know, her having me do that than it does for her doing it to me. But when there are those times, let me tell you, the last thing I want to do is initiate reconciliation. Right? For me, it's like, just like you. Like, I just want to kind of be in my feels about how, you know, everything Uh, that she did just like affected me, hurt me, or if she didn't consider something or whatever. And just, I just want to kind of let all that be what I'm focused on. And the last thing I want to do is just confront it and, and begin initiating towards reconciliation, you know, with my wife. I'm like, she hurt me, she should come to me, you know. <laughs> But, you know, once I stop and I pray, it's always the same answer. God is always like, all right, humble yourself. 
consider if there's a part you play in this, and then go and initiate, right? And, and it always happens that as I just do what it is that God tells us and instructs us to do, we begin to talk. At first, it's always awkward, right? It's always awkward to talk when you're both kind of upset and stuff. But eventually, things soften and, and, and everything's restored and, and we're good again, you know? But I just think about for us how hard it can be for us to initiate sometimes, right? How hardened we can get in the place when we're, when we're hurt. And, you know, Jesus actually said that marriages actually fail or end because of hardness of heart. And that applies to more than just marriages. But it's just the reality of the fact that when we're hurt, someone offends us, someone sins against us or whatever, it can be so easy to just get set in on how this affected us, how we feel and get set in on our side of things. And our heart could begin to get a little hard towards the offending party, towards the other person. And it's important for us to be paying attention to our hearts because God wants us to be maintaining a heart that is soft, not a heart that is hard. You know, our hearts, the Bible will talk about sometimes, like our hearts are like clay. You know, like our hearts are meant to be moldable and pliable in God's hands. How many of you have ever worked with clay? Maybe like when you were in school and stuff like that, right? And you know that it's like, I'm working with this thing. Like you tried to make like a coffee cup or a bowl, it didn't work out too well. You know, but you were, you were trying and when that thing was soft and pliable, like you can get it to do whatever. And as long as you needed to make corrections, as long as it was still soft, you were good. But as soon as that thing got hardened, how many of you know, it's like set it and forget it. Like it's, it's over. Now any mishandling, you know, anything that, that you just do wrong with that thing, if you drop it, it's broken, it's shattered, right? And that's how it could be with us. If we don't maintain a soft heart, our hearts get hard, man, it leads to so much brokenness. It leads to just when, you know, another offense happens or something, it's just things shatter and it's done. We gotta keep our hearts soft if we're gonna be these people who are able to initiate reconciliation I just want to share just a couple thoughts when it comes to keeping our hearts soft. First, I would say this. Remind yourself of all it is that you've been forgiven of. <laughs> just think about reconciliation. Think about all the things that God has reconciled you from. Think about the ways that God continues <laughs> just to to let that grace and that mercy and that forgiveness just flow your way so you can just live in that reconciliation. It's a good thing to remind ourselves of how much we've been forgiven. Jesus would actually teach about how the person who's been forgiven much loves much. You know, and, and it's just, it's important for us in maintaining our hearts to never forget what God did for us, to never forget how much he's forgiven us. To never get to this place where we're like, you know, hey, I've been following Jesus for some time now, I'm doing pretty good, you know? Like, and just start to forget how broken we once were, how lost we once were. Because when you remind yourself of what was that old that is now gone and the new that has come in your life, it is gonna keep your heart soft. Can I get an amen? Next thing I want to say is just spend time in God's presence. It is going to be really hard to keep a hard heart in the presence of God. And it's so important for us to spend time in his presence. You know, God is everywhere, but God is also somewhere. You know, we, we go about our lives, and the truth is we, all, we never live a day of our lives outside of the presence of God. But the reality is the Bible also says, seek my face, meaning seek my presence. And when God, you know, when we draw near to him, the Bible says he draws near to us. And there's just this reality of when you just set apart time just to be like, God, I just want to be with you. You know, whether you're throwing on worship music, whether you're just having a time of prayer or just with your word, but when you just set apart time to be in God's presence, he softens you. You know, there is not going to be someone who spent a life of just living in God's presence and at the end of their life, they've become this person that is more hardened. They're gonna be a person who is so soft. 
You know, I, I look at some of the people I look up to in their faith, and I just see how it's like, man, you guys are so quick to like cry, like it's crazy. But it's just, God just continues to like tenderize them and just make them soft. Like their hearts just, you know, are for people. Their hearts are just for God. Like they just become more and more compassionate and all these things over time, more forgiving, more loving. And that's what time in God's presence will continue to do to us. And we need to maintain a soft heart because in our relational lives, we're gonna be coming up to moments where we're gonna to need to initiate reconciliation. And the Bible doesn't care who was the offending party. The Bible looks at the Christian and says, hey, you're supposed to be like me, right? I go first. And so some of you might be in the middle of something. You might be in the middle of something with a friend, with a relative, I don't know. But someone's gonna have to go first in order for things to be made right. And if you ask God, he's probably gonna say, why don't you? <laughs> Come on, follow me. The next thing this verse says is not counting people's sins against them. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. This is the choice to cover sins or forgive them rather than count sins. You know, God chose to forgive our sins before we were ever even aware of our sins or even asked for forgiveness. You know, we oftentimes are gonna have to do the same if we want reconciliation with certain people in our lives. In 1 Peter 4, 8, this is actually a verse me and Nicole had up in our house when we first got married. It says, and above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. How many of you know we were being prepared? We were like, <laughs> we're gonna sin on each other, but uh, <laughs> love covers a multitude of sins, all right. You know, in these relational lives of ours, we are inevitably going to sin against one another. But the question is, how do we not let sin against us produce sin within us? How do we not let sin against us produce sin within us? You know, when we're sinned against, we're actually vulnerable. We become vulnerable to something like anger. You know, in Ephesians 4, 26 through 27, it says this, be angry and do not sin. So the Bible's not saying that you can't be angry. The Bible's saying, don't let sin against you produce sin within you. Be angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. You know, the enemy would love nothing more than, than to help you stay mad. Like he, he just wants to continue to just like stoke that anger that you're beginning to feel because he knows that when you and I are angry, we are susceptible to do some really unloving things, right? With our tongues, with, with just our actions, like all that with our minds, and we, we just become vulnerable. We, be, we become susceptible to just getting bitter as we just rehearse what they did and how they made us feel. We become susceptible to gossip as we go around and kind of talk to everyone but the person we should be talking to about what's gone down, and we become susceptible to pride. And, you know, there are very few things that can destroy relationships like pride. I don't think that hate is the opposite of love. I think that pride is the opposite of love, right? Because pride, it actually, you know, it promotes and it prefers self, where love denies self and it prefers another. You know, the Bible says that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And if God resisted, it's because it's something that's opposed to him. And God is love. And so pride is just something that we, we gotta resist. You know, the Bible says resist the devil, don't assist the devil. And I think sometimes we assist the devil rather than resist him through our anger and our pride. Because the truth is, you know, in, in, our, in our anger, a lot of times we just begin to feel justified about taking like a certain prideful stance on something. You know, I'm one of those people, I don't know what your kind of anger response is, um, but I'm one of those people where like, I, when I'm angry, like I don't blow up, like I kind of close up. And, and I think part of it's because, you know, like I, like I believe like I'm like a spiritual guy and stuff. And so I just don't really see like blowing up as like a very, you know, okay thing and stuff. But how many of you know closing up and just kind of boiling in anger is just as bad, if not worse, 
when it comes to, you know, like my wife is one of those ones where she will blow up. Like, you know, she's, she's half Mexican, like she could blow up, okay? <laughs> and like, she will blow up and then she's like, I feel better, you know? And I'm like, that's cool. <laughs> But like, meanwhile, I'm the one who's like letting the sun go up and down on my anger. And I'm just like boiling and, and, and all that. And it's just, it's one of those things where I've just had to realize, you know, like when I get angry, I also get prideful. And that's why I just like close up and I just stay in this place where it's like, I'm right, she's wrong, you know? And the way I'm responding is better and her way is worse. <laughs> and it's just, you get so justified in where you're at and get justified in your side of everything. Am I making sense to anybody, right? And, and we just can stay in this place and it just hinders us from doing exactly what we need to do, which is rather than rehearse and continue to count and even think about, man, they've done this to me so many times and just let all that stuff keep us in this place where we just wanna continue to hold that sin against them. God's trying to lead us to cover sin or forgive it so that we could actually move forward in reconciliation. And the thing is this, is that when we choose to cover sin rather than count sin, we're gonna receive two things at least. <laughs> you're gonna receive grace, but you're also gonna receive a freedom. You know, what God's looking for is your willingness, not necessarily your ability. Because I feel like for some of us, when we're in those places, we feel like, man, I'm not really like able to do this. I'm not able to forgive this. I'm not able to forgive them. And you may not be in and of yourself, but God can make you able to forgive it, to cover it, rather than continue to count it and rehearse it. What God is looking for is your willingness, where you say, God, I wanna choose to cover this. I want to forgive this, God. I don't wanna hold on to this, I want to. And when he has your willingness, he gives you the ability. He gives you his grace. Grace is God's power, his enablement to you to live like him. And he will give that to you. He will let his grace enable you so that you could extend grace to someone else. The other thing you're gonna get is you're also gonna get freedom because how many of you know that when you hold on to unforgiveness, you're actually the one who's locked up, right? This other person could be running free, but you're still locked up. How many of you have heard this quote? To forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you, right? Like, it, it, it's so true. And Jesus, I mean, he, he taught a parable that, that goes on about this. You can read about it in Matthew 18. You know, he talks about a servant that owed his master millions and the master was calling into account what he owed him. And it's all this debt that he has racked up with his master and the master's calling into account that debt and he has nothing to pay for it. And so he just begs and asks for mercy. He asks for forgiveness of this debt. And the master shows pity on him and actually forgives him the millions and lets him go free. But then this same person who was set free from their great debt goes and sees another servant who owes them 10,000 bucks. And he goes and he grabs this dude all angry and he starts to choke him and goes like, where's my money? You better pay me my money. And he tells him, you know, like, I don't, I don't have the money and all this stuff. And he takes this guy and he throws him into the debtor's prison. And the other servants that see what went down, they go and they tell the master what this servant did. And the master's not happy. <laughs> and he comes to this guy who was forgiven much and he tells him like, didn't I forgive you so much debt? And you could not show that same forgiveness, that same mercy to this servant? And the Bible says that that person who could not forgive, that they were thrown into the prison not to be let out. And Jesus is teaching this because Peter asked a question Lord, how many times do I gotta forgive someone? <laughs> you know, and, and think about it. In talking about forgiveness, Jesus is also using the metaphor of being imprisoned and being in debt, right? And what the Bible is trying to communicate to you and me is that whenever we hold on to unforgiveness, we are the ones who end up locked up. 
we are the ones who end up in prison. You might end up in a prison of bitterness. How many of you have met some bitter people in life? Usually there is gonna be some unforgiven person, some unforgiven thing that's just locked them up. How many of you have met someone who doesn't seem to be able to move beyond a certain part of their life, a certain thing that happened in their life? You will get locked up and you will get tormented if you live with unforgiveness. And this is why the Bible is telling you and me that God, he doesn't count our sins against us. He frees us, but he also wants us to be these people who don't count, but we cover sins, that we're these people who know that freedom that comes from releasing people of their debt, releasing people of their forgiveness. And as we even saw in some of those passages, God's like, I've forgiven you much. If you don't forgive them, then I'm not gonna forgive you. So how many of you know forgiveness is a must? When it comes to us as, as believers and following Jesus, forgiveness, it's not even a question. Forgiveness is always a must in a situation. But we're talking about reconciliation tonight and reconciliation is not just about getting to the point of forgiveness. Reconciliation is about having something restored to a right relationship. And so forgiveness is a must, but it has to go beyond just forgiving the old. It has to go into being open to the new. As verse 17 said, the old is gone, the new has come. And that's the power of forgiveness. It frees us from the past and it actually brings us into the place where there's a, a new possibility here. There's a new reality. And that's what reconciliation ultimately leads to. That's why the next thing it says in this verse is, he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And what this speaks to is the restoration of trust, right? It speaks to the fact that what's crazy about the reconciliation process that God even walked through with us is that God didn't just forgive us, but God has actually restored us in right relationship, but also entrusted us with a great responsibility. He's entrusted us with much. The Bible says that he entrusted us with the ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation. That's, that's the gospel. But what it gets at is the fact that God was not just interested in just forgiving you and me. He was interested in living in relationship with you and me because there is no such thing as relationship without trust. Trust is the foundation of every relationship. And without it, there's not going to be a real relationship. But the thing is this, is that forgiveness is a must. Trust isn't. You know, forgiveness is a must. Trust isn't. Trust is only necessary if a relationship is desired, right? And the thing is, is that trust is going to be something that ultimately leads to us entrusting people. You know, you're going you're gonna to begin to demonstrate your trust by entrusting them with something. So it's maybe entrusting them once again with your confidence and sharing some stuff with them. When you're like, last time, you know, you actually said some stuff that I shared with you in confidence and it, it actually really affected my trust. And but you've initiated reconciliation, you've forgiven it. And part of the restoration is gonna be, you know, I'm actually going to not just withhold, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you once again. You know, entrusting with, things that are kind of valuable to us, meaningful to us. That, that's the beginnings of beginning to work towards reconciliation. It's what we see God doing. And this can be the hardest part of reconciliation. And it actually requires wisdom from God. Because like I said, forgiveness is a must, but reconciliation isn't. And I kind of need to place a disclaimer here because there are certain people that it may not be wise for you and me at this time in our lives, or maybe even not ever, to actually trust. You know, and the Bible nowhere says you got to trust everyone. It does say you better forgive everyone, right? But there may be some circumstances, there may be some people where you just can't trust. And an example can be an abuser. An abuser should not be trusted unless there has been some real repentance. And I mean like real repentance to where there's been like real transformation. 
but there's also been some real time to actually see that the whole of what has taken place is real. And even then, I would proceed with caution if a relationship is desired there. You know, but there are some times where, where trust may not be what is actually wise. And so sometimes the answer to whether or not someone should be trusted is yes, and sometimes it's actually no. And that's why I say it requires God's wisdom sometimes when it comes to this. Because reconciliation is about leading to, you know, being in right relationship once again. And if we're going to establish trust once again, you know, we're going to have to give opportunity to someone and we're going to have to grant them that chance to restore trust with us. And so I just want to share some thoughts real quick on what it might look like to restore trust with someone where they don't fall into that category. But it's someone maybe that even in your life currently, you're like, I'm try- I, want to, I want to reconcile this relationship. You know, I, I want to, I might even go from tonight and begin to initiate. I want to forgive. I, I want to ultimately be back into friendliness with this person. Maybe it's a friend you fell out with. You know, maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's someone else in work or maybe it's someone in this room, right? But I just want to share a few things real quick around what restoring trust what we could do to do that. First thing is this, is prayer. (laughs) And you're like, obviously. But prayer, the reason why the first thing you should do is pray is because what God's gonna do when you and I pray is he's actually gonna give us some perspective. You know, he might help you to see something and frame something within the circumstance in a way that, that you would not unless you actually came and brought this to God and asked him for his help and for his his wisdom on this, right? But through praying also, God can give you peace. And he can give you the ability to know whether or not this is actually something that you should be doing. You know, through prayer, you might find that you don't have peace about trusting someone. Through prayer, you might find that, hey, no, it's, it's okay, even though this situation is kind of fuzzy to you. But through prayer, God will give you perspective and he'll give you, you peace. And so it's always the best place for us to start. And the next thing I would say is counsel and advice. You know, to, to include some others into that process of reconciliation for yourself when it comes to just helping you in how to proceed and how to move forward in this restoration process and in a certain relationship, right? You know, having godly counsel around us helps us to succeed in things in life. And it will help you when it comes to, you know, you moving forward and trusting someone again to get some counsel and advice because they might ask you some questions that will help you to think through, you know, the ways to even proceed with trusting them. They might share with you a story from their own you know, experience that is gonna speak to you and give you wisdom. They might even help you when it comes to the you know, how-to on doing this, but having counsel and advice is something that's really important when it comes to this. And the next thing would be set realistic expectations and start small. You know, that's something that for me and Nicole, it was, it was actually that came out of counsel and advice that we were given in trying to restore trust with a family member in our lives. And for us, we we had a desire to begin to extend trust to someone once again, but we also had a standard that was a little too high for where they were actually at with the things they were struggling with in their life. And so it was kind of like, yeah, we, we can trust them, but they need to absolutely not, never, ever do this again. And the person was like, is that a realistic expectation? Like, they've been struggling with this for years. Like, do you think really, like, coming in and trying to restore with that expectation of them, like, that that's actually going to work out? Like, I feel like you're only setting yourself up to be right back where you started. What's a more realistic expectation for this person? You know, and, and it helped us because through that counsel, through that advice, we were like, okay, yeah, that's not realistic. We have to kind of start somewhere with them and set you know, a certain expectation, but not an unrealistic one. And so hopefully that makes sense to you. 
you know, maybe it's just like, don't just jump back into dating that person again. <laughs> but start somewhere, you know? Maybe it's not just jump right back in to where you were at, at the same level with that certain friend or whatever, but it's starting somewhere. You know, start small. And the next thing I'd say is give it time because trust is only developed over time. You know, trust is something that you and I can lose real fast, but in order for us to gain it again, it takes time. And so you just gotta give some things time when it comes to the process of restoring trust. And then the last thing I would say is pray. <laughs> just continue to pray around the whole thing and just cover it because it's gonna, it's gonna help you to just stay in the right place in your spirit, in your mind, around the restoration process. Does that make sense? You know, forgiveness is unconditional. Reconciliation is conditional because reconciliation is dependent upon the other person's response. How many of you have ever tried to reconcile with someone, but they were just unwilling, right? And so, you know, when it comes to this whole thing, we, we got to be these, these people who are beginning to say, you know, Jesus, I want to follow you in this. I want to be more like you in this. I want to be someone, you know, who, who doesn't just let being, you know, offended and hurt or sinned against keep me from initiating. Like, I, I want to be someone who's willing to initiate. I want to be someone who's not living in unforgiveness, but someone who's covering sins rather than counting them and working towards restoring things. You know, but, but sometimes even though with all those things in our heart and all of our efforts, it may not be something where a situation turns out the way we hoped or things are fully reconciled because reconciliation depends on a person's part in it and their willingness to be reconciled. That's why actually in this verse, as you read on, the Bible says, be reconciled to God. It's like God's already chosen. He wants to be reconciled to you, but it's up to you. Do you want to be reconciled to him? And it's because it's conditional. And that's why even in Romans 12, 18, and we'll, we'll end here, it says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I'm glad it says, if it is possible. <laughs> and so for us, what matters is that we're the ones who are saying, you know what? I want to be someone who lives in healthy and lasting relationships in my life. I wanna be someone who lives, you know, with the ministry of reconciliation in my life. And we're these people who are desiring to be, you know, more like Jesus when it comes to these things in our life. But that we're also just recognizing, hey, it's not always gonna be, you know, possible. But as much as it is possible, I wanna be the person who's living at peace with others in my life. Can I get an amen?